Uh, today is a kiss first appearance for both of them. The charges that will be preferred against both accused the Osho are that of contravention of Section 3 of the PRECA Act, Yosho, that will be the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act 12 of 2004. The other charges that will be related to the accused Yosho is that of uh, contravention of Section 4 Yosho. Yoshepa, both accused Yoshepa have uh, presented themselves to the investigating of Sai Yoshepa. And I can just place on record that the charges that will be preferred against the accused fall under the ambit of our schedule 5 Yoshepa. It is by virtue of the following facts. Can, can I please have the charge sheet, Mr. Mukhavi? the charge sheet is before court already. Oh, before court. Correct. Let me just check. Oh, I think it's under this. Right, let's start. Um, you don't have opposition. I just have to make a ruling before you go to the charges them, themselves and the bail application. Yes, please, for the, court, the, for the media house, so that I can make a ruling for them. Yes, please, the court, Yoshepa. I was approached this morning in relation to the permission to record the proceedings, Yoshepa. The application, the necessary documents have been handed to the court on the part of the state. There's no objection, Yoshepa. I suppose both my colleagues on behalf of both accused Yoshep can then uh, indicate to the court their status in relation to the recording of the proceedings. Mr. Your Worship, uh, on behalf of uh, accused number one, we have no issue with that. Thank you. Mr. Majavu has already indicated, but it was off record. Can we just place it on record now? Like Worship, initially so. On behalf of my client, Mr. Zizi Kwadwa, as a public representative, he appreciates the role of the media in a constitutional democracy. In the result, he has no objection to the media being admitted to cover these proceedings. As the court pleases. All right, the application for recording of proceedings is granted by this court as prayed for by the media houses. Um, I requested that there should be no movement during the proceedings. Um, I also request that 
the uh, equipments or apparatus that you are using should not disturb the mechanical recording that we use in the court. All right. You can start with your. Sorry about that, Mr. As please, the court, your ship will just for administrative purposes. Your ship will note that attached to the J15 are two warrants for us that has been executed today, your ship. I have the request that both warrants be cancelled in respect of both, both accused, your ship. Warrant of arrest authorized against the case one and two, respectively, are cancelled, dated the 4th of June. <coughs> Please, the court, Your Worship. May I then further uh, proceed addressing the court? Yes, your Worship, not only is this the accused's uh, first appearance, Your Worship, the charges that will be brought against the accused are as follows. Your Worship will know that the charge sheet that has been attached to the J15 is numbered on uh, the top right of the page. On page 5, Your Worship, of the charge sheet, there's a clear indication in relation to the following charges that will be preferred against both accused. It is contravention of section 3, uh, right with relevant sections of the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act of 12 of 2004. Firstly and secondly, Your Worship, on page 8, Your Worship will note also that uh, it is uh, further the following charges, Your Worship, that it is contravention of section 4, right with 11 sections of the Prevention and o uh, prevention of Organized Crime Act 1-1 of 1998, Your Worship. The state submit that the charges that are preferred against both accused, Your Worship, fall within the ambit of Schedule 5. It is because of the following reasons. Page 3 of the charge sheet indicates the amounts that are involved, Your Worship, and the total amount is uh, 1,680,000. And by virtue of that, as well as the fact that the state will be alleging the commission of the offence by uh, common purpose, it is the state's humble submission that the offences preferred against both accused, Your Worship, fall under the ambit of Schedule 5. That all from yourself? Yes, upon part of the state, that should be all in the light of the fact that it is a schedule for our fellowship. Obviously, the defense bears the onus of proving that it is the interest of justice that uh, the accused can be released on bail, Your Worship. Please, the court. Mr. Smosny, let's start with the schedule. You Worship, thank you. I, I confirm that uh, I'm in agreement with the prosecutor that this is a Schedule 5 bail application and that you have to be persuaded, ma'am, that the accused can be released on bail. Mr. Major? 
confirm the same, Your Worship. The court rules that this matter falls under schedule five. Yes, please, the court, Your Worship, but just uh, inadvertently permitted to indicate that it is a unopposed Schedule 5 bail application. Yes, please, the court. Before you start, Mr. Smoltz, let me just warn the two applicants before court. Can the applicants be, uh, please rise? <clears throat> the court is going to warn you regarding the provisions of Section 6011, Capital B, of the Criminal Procedure Act. You, as the applicants, you have a duty to disclose a record of your previous convictions, a record of your pending cases where you are released on bail, and a record of any protection orders that were granted by the court um, pertaining to the Domestic Violence uh, Act or the Protection from Harassment Act. If you willfully mislead this court or refuse to provide that information, when convicted for failure to disclose that information, you will be sentenced to a fine of 80,000 rents or two years imprisonment. I hope I'm audible enough. All right. I know I speak a bit softer, but I hope I'm audible enough. So let me start with applicant number one. Did you understand what the court has said? Yes, sir. Number two? Yes, sir. Thank you. The rest I'll get from the attorneys, but if it's not covered pertaining to Section 6011, Capital B, I'll inquire before they close their case. So on the second aspect, the court is going to warn you of your duty, of your, in fact, of your right to remain silent. It's a constitutional right to remain silent in any court of law. Now, you have a right to remain silent when this court is dealing with the facts of the case. So you have a right to remain silent on the facts of the case because this is a bail proceeding. However, if you waive your right to remain silent and disclose the facts of the case, this court is warning you that the evidence presented in this court will be used in the trial court against you and will be presented as a prima facie evidence. Did you understand me? Accused number one? Yes, I understand. Number two? Thank you, Mary State. <coughs> All right, before you start, Mr. Smallsmith, I just want to record the rights quickly.
smoothly. Since the owners rest with the applicants, you can open your case. Your Worship, thank you. I've explained to the accused that even though the state may indicate that they don't oppose bail, the ultimate decision lies with you. Thank you. Uh, your Worship, we've prepared an affidavit, handed it to the prosecutor for him to consider. Uh, I beg to read it into the record, Your Worship. Do you have an extra copy for the court? I can, so that I can present the, the court please. with an extra copy. Uh, it is in fact a signed one, which I can hand up, and then I can just read from the copy. Thank you. Your Worship, <coughs> thank you. In the regional court for the regional division of Gauteng, held at the Palm Ridge Specialized Commercial Crime Court in the matter between John McKay, the applicant, and the state. An affidavit in support of an application for bail. I, the undersigned, Gian McKay, do hereby make oath and state as follows. I am the applicant in this matter, and this is an application for bail. I'm an adult male aged 47 years of age with the following personal particulars and background. Identification number 7609055109080. My identity document may be made available to the Honourable Court during this application. My date of birth, 5 September 1976. My citizenship, I hold dual citizenship of South Africa and Canada. Travel documents, I have a valid South African and Canadian passport, which I have handed to the investigating officer today. I request, however, that I be permitted to travel abroad, provided I get the permission of the investigating officer and the prosecutor. Previous travel or residence in foreign countries. I spent a large part of my youth in Canada, where I went to school and to university. My mother resides there. I returned to South Africa in 1999, and I have no intention of living in Canada or anywhere else relatives resident outside of South Africa. My mother and sisters reside in Canada. Assets outside of South Africa, none. Personal background, place of birth, I was born in Kimberley. Schooling, I attended Sayeti Primary School in Bedford View, Johannesburg and one year at Glen Vista. My family then immigrated to Vancouver in Canada where I attended high school at Rick Hansen Secondary School. Tertiary and or other training. I attended UCFV where I studied economics as part of a Bachelor's of General Studies and Computer Systems at BCIT. After returning to South Africa, I studied Management Development, a Diploma at UPE and a Master's in Business Administration at the University of Wales through University of Johannesburg. My work history, I worked as a data-based programmer for a company called MarketLink in Canada. Upon returning to South Africa, I joined uh, Technical Software Systems where I was the operations director for three years. I later set up a company called TSS Management Services where I was the managing director up until 2012 when I joined EOH Mtombu as public sector executive. I left EOH Mtombu in 2019 and I've since been working at Titan Investment and Advisory. A general remarks regarding the background and, perm and permanency. South Africa is my home and has been my permanent residence for the past 25 years and will continue to be so. My father, with whom I have an exceptionally close relationship, and I left Canada together and moved back home. My daughter and my ex-wife also resides in Johannesburg. I cannot and will not abscond and risk living the life of a fugitive and being unable to spend time with my family openly and freely. Current status, address, 74 Culros Road, Bryanston, Johannesburg. The property belongs to our family's trust. Marital status, 
I am divorced. Dependents, I have two dependents. My son from a previous relationship lives in Brazil with his mother and my daughter lives in Morningside in Johannesburg. Occupation, I'm currently providing advisory services to Titan Investment and Advisors. Income from occupation, I earn 80,000 Rand a month. Other sources of income, I occasionally receive discretionary dividends from uh, our family-owned trust. My assets, I do not own fixed property in my own name, but I prefer to invest in motor cars. I have found that the correct investment in these sort of vehicles are dollar hedges and appreciate more than fixed property. I own two sports cars, cumulatively valued at 12 million rand, and a Range Rover that, are, that is valued at 3 million rand. I owe 4 million rand on the vehicles and I have 400,000 rand in savings. Availability and sources of funds for bail. I can pay bail from my savings and it has been suggested, subject to the decision of this court, that I have 30,000 rand at court today to pay bail. History of antisocial behaviour. <coughs> Previous convictions, none. Pending criminal cases, none. I declare that I have not been released on bail in respect of any other charge. I also declare that I have no knowledge of any outstanding warrants against me. I further declare that I do not have an order against me as, con as contemplated in Section 5 or 6 of the Domestic Violence Act of 1998, nor do I have an order against me as complicated as compli Sorry, as, as contemplated in Section 3 or Section 9 of the Protection from Harassment Act of 2011, or any similar order in terms of any other law. Arrest and factual background, the date of arrest. I was arrested on 5 June 2024, you wish that is today of course, after an arrangement was made with the NPA and the DPCI last week to hand myself over. Before this, I attended to the offices of the DPCI a few weeks ago for formalities regarding the warning statement. The facts that led to my arrest were canvassed in detail at the Zondu Commission, and although I was never asked to give evidence or to comment on the allegations, I have been aware of the fact that the DPCI were investigating these allegations for a few years now. The allegations that led to my arrest are that I bribed my co-accused Minister Zizi Kodwa to influence the cancellation of a tender at the Department of Home Affairs in 2015. I deny the allegations against me and I believe that further investigations will reveal that the tender was not cancelled because of anything either I or my co-accused did. I admit that I openly gave money to my co-accused, who is a close friend of mine, when he was not a government official and when he was the spokesperson of the ANC. I have made a detailed warning statement in the matter where I request that the investigating officer take statements from key individuals that would confirm my version and that the tender was cancelled for valid and lawful reasons and not because of any attempts by my co-accused and or I to have it cancelled. Uh, offences charged with, although I have not seen the charge sheet, I have been informed that I'm charged with, uh, that I'm charged in terms of section 3 and 4 of BRCA. You wish may I interpose and say that this morning, uh, whilst the uh, uh, applicant was in custody, the prosecutor handed me a copy of the charge sheet. Intend to plead, I intend to plead not guilty, my defence. I've submitted a detailed warning statement to the authorities and deny that the tender was cancelled because of anything I did or asked my co-accused to do. From the information I have, the tender was not only cancelled, but never re-advertised and never awarded to any person or entity, lot alone, let alone to me or any entity associated to me. The submissions regarding the factors to be considered when deciding whether bail should be granted. Schedule in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act. Your Worship, uh, it's common causes to Schedule 5, but the affidavit reads, I've been advised that this is an offence that resorts under Schedule 5 and that I have to persuade the court that the interest of justice permits my release on bail. 
uh, considerations in terms of section 64A to E, 64A, the danger to the public or individual safety. I respectfully submit that there is no likelihood that my release on bail will endanger the public safety or that of any particular individual. I have no history of violent behaviour, nor do I have any predisposition to commit offences referred to in Schedule 1 of the Criminal Procedures Act, uh, Act 51 of 1977, whilst released on bail. I hold no grudges against anyone either. I also will not commit any offences against any person in a, uh, in a domestic relationship as defined in Section 1 of the Domestic Violence Act of 1998 or any offence referred to in the Protection from Harassment Act of 2011. Likelihood of evasion of trial. <coughs> Respectfully submit that there is no likelihood that I will attempt to evade my trial. I submit that this is evident from my conduct since the inception of the investigation. I have not, su I have not supplied any false information, nor have I supplied any information uh, any false information for purposes of this application. I undertake to attend court faithfully on each and every occasion to which this case might be postponed to. I have no intention to live the life of a fugitive. It is very important for me to clear my name. Interference with witnesses or evidence. I do not know all the witnesses um, as I have not been provided with a list of possible state witnesses. There has not been an allegation that I have attempted to influence or intimidate, uh, intimidate any witnesses as far as they are known to me. I therefore respectfully submit that there is no likelihood that the subsection is at risk to be infringed upon should I be admitted to bail. Section, four, section 4D, the jeopardy to the functioning of the criminal justice system or bail system. I submit that there is no likelihood that this subsection is potentially to be infringed upon should I be released on bail. I have not furnished any false information to the investigating officer, nor have I furnished any false information for purposes of this application. In fact, I have fully cooperated with the, with the authorities and attended previous meetings and handed myself over this morning on their request. In the interest of justice in relation to the right to be released on bail. I respectfully submit that I will be prejudiced in the event that I am detained. I am not a flight risk and will certainly not interfere in the investigations of this matter and with witnesses. I also urge upon this honourable court that should I be detained and refuse bail, I would be prejudiced in the preparation of my defence and it would have a, a devastating effect on my personal and commercial life. It is extremely difficult to consult with a legal representative inside a prison and I have no doubt that my continued detention will seriously jeopardize my preparation for trial. Other relevant factors, the state does not oppose my release on bail but I fully understand that the court is not bound by that and that the court will have the ultimate say with regards to my freedom. I respectfully submit that the interests of justice do permit my release on bail and that I am therefore entitled to be admitted to bail. Respectfully submit that the court should grant bail to me in an appropriate amount and with such conditions as the court may deem fit. Your Worship, this statement was signed a short while ago. Uh, the prosecutor has a copy and I, may I ask that this be handed up as Exhibit A, Your Worship. Thank you. Your Worship, lastly, as far as the applicant is concerned, we are not going to reduce any verbal evidence, and that would be his case for bail. Yeah. Can you please address Mr. McKay? Did you understand the contents of the affidavit that was read on record? Yes, I did.
do you confirm its content? Yes, I do. Affidavit of the first applicant is marked Exhibit A, and the applicant's case of number one is closed. You may move Ms. Major to the application. Your Worship, might I take the liberty of handing the original duly signed copy of my client's affidavit to enable the court? To journey with me as I discharge the old master address of my client. Thank you. Secondly, Your Worship, may I also deal with a few preliminary issues for the sake of completeness. Firstly, Your Worship, I can confirm flowing from the courts warning of my client apropos section 6011 capital B A Roman figures 1 and 2 that he has neither a previous conviction nor cases pending fortunately we deal with that in the body of the affidavit what we do not expressly converse and I'm indebted to the court is with regard to the protection order bit he will confirm that when the court engages with him but I can gladly tell the court that uh, he does not have any protection or in place. In fact, his beautiful and loving wife is in the gallery today. I can also confirm that from my engagement with the state, this is indeed an application that proceeds on an unopposed basis. That we don't take it. I have explained to my client that the ultimate decision rests with the court. I therefore proceed against that background. You, the affidavit reads as follows. In the regional court for the regional division of Houteng held at the specialized commercial court, crimes court in Johannesburg, case number S triple C 37 slash 2024. The matter between Net is of good enough Zizi Koto as the applicant and the state as the respondent. Between parallel lines, this is an affidavit in support of a bail application in terms of section 60 of the Criminal Procedure 51 of 1977 as amended, and it reads as follows. I, the undersigned net is of good enough Koto, ID number as stated, do hereby make oath and state as follows. One, that I am the accused and up in this matter, currently employed as a Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture in the sixth administration in the Republic of South Africa, having been so appointed in March 2023. And prior to that, I was appointed as a Deputy Minister of State Security in 2019. Incidentally, that Parliament has prorogued. I'm an adult male, 54 years old of age having been born on 19 January 1970. I'm a South African citizen having been born in the Republic of South Africa. I do possess and I'm the holder of a valid passport, including an official passport by virtue of the office I hold. Needless to say, I travel outside of the borders of the Republic of South Africa from time to time as the exigencies of my oath in dictates from time to time. 
My residential address is 154 Epping Drive, Danefen Golf Estate in Johannesburg. My family and I have been living and ordinarily resident at this house for the past two and a half years. Apropos my personal circumstances, I'm gainfully employed as a Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture in the Sixth Administration, which has recently prorogued in the light of the elections a few days ago. My family background, I'm married to Mrs. Zama and we've been blessed with two minor children aged six and six months. I do own movable property as I am the bona fide possessor of a motor vehicle discovery Land Rover 2020 model valued at 950,000 rands, which is still under installment sale agreement. My wife and I, to whom I am married in community of property, own furniture and appliances and household effects valued at 350,000 rands. I also own my personal effects estimated at 80,000 rands. Immovable property, my wife and I currently are currently the source of the property referred to above as my current residential address, which we intend to purchase in due course. Bonds or contacts outside South Africa. I do not have any family or contacts or friends who are permanently based outside South Africa. Neither do I have any offshore accounts. Previous convictions, I do not have any previous convictions. <coughs> pending cases, I do not have any cases pending that I know of except the current one. I also confirm that my lawyer has warned me about the consequences of a false declaration in this regard and still stand by the answer I've given here in above. The current case. I'm aware of the nature and gravity of the punishment which is likely to be imposed should I be convicted of the charges against me. May I interpose to indicate that I confirm that I've only recently been placed in possession of the charge sheet now in court and I take no issue with that, neither does my client. And I intend pleading not guilty and I'm determined to attend court on all these dates as directed by the Honorable Court to do so as I have full faith and confidence in our criminal justice system. I will disclose my version at the appropriate stage during the trial and will take the court into my own confidence. At that stage, having been duly finished with the contents of the docket, I would know in greater detail the actual allegations against me and the case I am required to meet. A brief factual matrix. At this stage, I gathered that my prosecution is a sequel to the findings and recommendations from the State Capture Commission and all some parts of my testimony to the Commission. I went to the Commission out of a deep sense of respect for the rule of law and participated therein with a clean conscience and in line with willingness to be held accountable. I never located myself as being above the law. <coughs> that position has not changed, notwithstanding how I feel about this prosecution. I will not attempt to evade my trial or in any manner undermine the administration of justice with reference to this matter. I accept that by absconding, I will forfeit my bail money to the state and can be re-arrested and remanded in custody with no option of a fine. I confirm that I have no intention of interfering with state witnesses, as I have no knowledge of who they are at this stage. Nor do I have any intentions of concealing or destroying evidence in the possession of the state. Thus far, I have cooperated fully with the police. Given the fact that at this stage my legal representatives have not yet had sight of the docket, I am unaware of any outstanding evidence to be collected, and thus less likely to frustrate those efforts. <coughs> Hence my undertaking not to do so in the future up until the finalization of my trial. I am willing to comply with all bail conditions in terms of Section 62 of the Criminal Procedure Act as amended, that this Honorable Court may deem necessary in granting me bail. 
I am also prepared to hand in my personal, emphasize personal passport to the investigating officer should the court so direct. Alternatively, I undertake to notify the investigating officer should I be required to travel outside the borders of the Republic of South Africa. At all material times during my arrest, I cooperated fully with the police. My legal representative was also in direct communication with the investigating officer as well as the senior state advocate who is responsible for this matter. Hence my appearance today as properly coordinated and without any undue delay at my instance. Regarding the merits of this case, I elect to exercise my right to remain silent <laughs> save to the extent that I will disclose my defense fully at the appropriate stage of the trial. I'm not privy to the details pertaining to the charges except for the generalized allegations arising from my testimony at the State Capture Commission. I will be better edified when the state discloses the contents of the docket and a final charge sheet to me which I am informed will only happen when the investigations are completed. I am also unaware of the identity of state witnesses and thus unlikely to interfere with them or otherwise imperil any outstanding investigation. However, should the state be prepared to provide me with a list of its witnesses here and now, I will undertake and refrain from making any contact with them. I can afford bail in the amount of 25,000 rents, which I have with me. I have also been advised by my legal representative that the posting of bail is not in and of itself meant to be a punitive measure, but rather a process that is aimed at fairness and equity and ensuring that if admitted to bail, I do not invade my trial. I am also prepared to put up any collateral as may be directed by the court, only should that be deemed necessary. I will certainly suffer an impediment to the preparation of my defense if I am detained, in, if I'm kept in detention. I humbly request this honorable court to grant me bail in the amount of 25,000 rents, as I believe that it will be in the interest of justice that I be released on bail or in any manner as the court might determine. I am also prepared to comply with other conditions which the court may impose. I submit that I am not a flight risk. Even when the assertions made by the prosecution regarding the circumstances of my arrest, it is clear that I am not a flight risk. If anything, I was eager to make my first appearance even on an earlier date, and that much the investigating officer can confirm. For all intents and purposes, my conduct thus far is indicative of the fact that I'm a good candidate to be admitted to bail. My roots are deeply entrenched in South Africa, and it is in my interest also to stand trial and clear my name. I have been advised that in terms of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, I'm presumed innocent until actually announced guilty by a court of law. I have also been made aware that my imminent arrest has been publicized in various forms of media by those who seem to know more about me than me. For the record, I can confirm that the investigating officer and other law enforcement officers treated me fairly, but no differently. My preparedness to cooperate was made at the first available opportunity. In fact, the investigating officer, Colonel Bujosi, even commended me for the promptness with which I returned his one and only call. I even went to meet him at his offices without my legal representative to sign the warning statement which set the process of my appearance in court in motion. However, my constitutional rights cannot be sacrificed at the altar of publications and other statements by my political detractors over which I have no control. For what it is worth, and in the light of my utmost cooperation, 
I was informed by the investigating officer that they would not oppose my admission to bail. And the same sentiment was expressed to me by the legal representative of the state in the form of the senior state advocate handling this matter. In conclusion, I'm a law-abiding citizen and an accountable leader in my own right. I have full confidence in the judicial system of the Republic of South Africa and will, like any other constitutional subject, respect the rule of law. I genuinely believe that I have discharged the onus that rests on me to demonstrate that the interest of justice indeed permits my release on bail. The statement was duly signed on the second day of June 2024 at my offices in Mondio, and it is duly attached to in front of a commissioner of old. That is the applicant's affidavit. May I ask that it be admitted into record and mark exhibit B if the court would so permit. Thank you. And I confirm that we do not intend to lead any further evidence, oral or otherwise, and that would be the applicant's case. Unless there is any aspect that the court might wish to hear me <coughs> on, that is our application. Thank As you, the sir. court pleases. Thank you. Did you understand the contents of the affidavit that was read on record? Yes, sir. Do you confirm the contents? Yes, sir. All right, your attorney indicated that you omitted in the affidavit itself to include the fact that are there any protection orders granted against you? There are none. Thank you. <coughs> you may be seated. Thank you. Your cell phones, I'm requesting now for the please last time. Your cell phones, please. I humbly request. We are recording this machine. It's also on the network like your cell phone. So it can interrupt the recordings. I'm pleading with you, members in the gallery. The affidavit of the second applicant is not exhibit B, and the case of the second applicant is closed. I'm handing over to you, Counsel, Mr. Kharif. Please, the court, Your Worship. Your Worship, as indicated earlier, the application is unopposed, Your Worship. And I can just indicate that the respondent, Your Worship, will not be calling any witness to testify viva voce and or presenting any affidavit in relation to this. However, will be requesting to address the court from the bar, Your Worship, and with leave of the court, may I kindly be permitted to proceed doing so, All right, let me just close your case first. 
so that you can address when you're submitting your closing address. I'll permit you to do so. Yes, please, of course. So I'm closing your case now. No evidence orally or documentary requirements of an affidavit. Your yes, Worship, indeed, suffice to say that uh, I can confirm that, firstly, in respect of the first applicant, they have be, there are no as previous convictions, Your Worship, or any pending matter. <coughs> Secondly, his personal particulars have been confirmed. That is his place of residence, Your Worship. Okay. Can I just allow that when you do the closing address, as long as there's no any other evidence, evidence to be laid? As please the court, Your Worship. All right. So I'm closing the respondent's case. As please the court. Smallsmith, may I just get your closing address, sir? Your Worship, thank you. Your Worship, um, one may wonder why where the state has no objection to bail and the accused wants bail that the ultimate decision lies with the court. And the reason for that is very simple. You are completely objective. You are not involved in the matter whatsoever. You played no part in the investigations, you do not know the accused, and you would adjudicate the matter on the evidence presented before you today. That is how our legal system works. You worship, <coughs> worship the, uh, the basic principles of bail I do not, uh, uh, I do not have to address you on. It is, it, it is mainly to strike a balance between the personal liberty of the accused for him not to be detained unless it's necessary and to make sure that the interest of society is not prejudiced by his release in that he may interfere with witnesses and the investigation. It's not a form of, of anticipatory punishment and uh, it, it should not be punitively applied. So under those circumstances, Your Worship, I believe that the evidence should move Your Worship to decide that it is in the interest of justice for the applicant, accused number one in the matter, to be released on bail. Uh, your Worship can indicate uh, to me if you would like me to address you at this stage already on the conditions or if you would only like me to address you on that once you've made your decision. No, the full address is okay. Your Worship, thank you. Thank you. Your Worship, uh, the ability of the accused but to pay a, a, a reasonable amount of bail uh, uh, has been presented to Your Worship. The only real issue that we have would be the accused's ability to travel abroad. We did not take any chances by not handing in both his passports. And may I recommend that, um, that one of the conditions of bail is that he is entitled to uh, travel abroad if he presents a, a proper itinerary and the investigating officer and the prosecutor agrees to it. We would be quite happy with that, Your Worship. Uh, and that under those circumstances, his movements would be uh, monitored by the authorities. Your Worship, lastly, uh, <coughs> you've seen it in the, uh, in the affidavit. This is pretty much a textbook appearance in court. It was, there was police investigation that was done. Accused was called to present himself for the making of a warning statement a few weeks ago. Uh, no I handed and Jack booted arrest followed. The police and the NPA requested him to surrender himself this morning. He did. He was properly processed, brought straight to court, and here we have at the first appearance a proper and a detailed Schedule 5 bail application. In an ideal world, we would like all matters to be dealt with like that. Your Worship, under that circumstances, uh, I believe that it is in the interest of justice for the accused to be released and uh, I request that that would also be your finding. Thank you.
you should my apologies there is one very important aspect that I omitted okay. because I only heard it a, a short while ago understand from the state that investigations are completed and we will be presented with a copy of the docket this morning already so okay. there's really no reason why uh, this matter would not be able to start uh, uh, as soon as uh, um, as proper instructions have been taken and the court will permit it. Thank you. Mr. Yamajabu, closing address, sir. Yeah. Firstly, Your Worship, a useful starting point is to deal with the law. I submit, Your Worship, that we have discharged the onus that rests on my client as the applicant in the form of an affidavit which in and of itself is evidence under oath and it stands before you uncontroverted. Secondly, if one was privy to the charge sheet prior to the drafting of the affidavit, I would have gladly relished an opportunity to say something about the strength <coughs> of the state's case. To the extent that the charge sheet was handed to me literally across the table by my learned friend, I beg leave of the courts to just say one or two from the back because I do believe that it would be an important aspect that should go into the portfolio of factors that the court will consider, notwithstanding our collegial arrangements that the matter is unopposed. I'm one who doesn't like to leave things to chance. I've had my hand beaten a few times with the NPA. Your Worship, it is clear that there is reliance to the principle of common purpose, which I can tell you for free has not even been properly pleaded in the charge sheet. However, to the extent that the state seeks to rely on that, I am simply placing on record that they will be hard-pressed to draw the legal nexus on which a common purpose is packed with reference to the specific provisions of PRECA. I would have dealt with that in my client's affidavit to demonstrate that all there is is a carbon copy of what was said in the Zondo Commission. We'll deal with that when we peruse the the content, and I'm glad that uh, it will be made available today. I would have been remiss if I don't touch on that. But having said that, Your Worship, we believe that we have covered all the essential averments that need to be made with regard to the lens through which a court determining a bail application under Schedule 5 must deal with. And there's no need for me to rehash those submissions because they stand unopposed before you. The only last issue to deal with and I'm latching on to what my learned friend has said. If indeed the investigations are complete, then there is little or no reason for any other form of stringent bail conditions apropos the investigation being imperiled may be attached. However, we do not say that the court is not at liberty to impose any other conditions as the court might be fit. However, to the extent that the court might be, and pardon me for being futuristic, inclined to give a condition with reference to the contact of state witnesses, I think now it may be opportune for the state, when he's on his feet, to then say, these are the witnesses that we would like you not to make contact with, because it is no longer a secret because the investigation is complete and will be given a content of the docket today. If we don't deal with it in that manner, Your Worship, we run the risk of being back here to deal with a possible application for the variation of a bail. And I'm saying it collegially and with respect. That's the one thing. The second thing, uh, Your Worship, you will note that in the bail affidavit, we deliberately state clear of saying anything about the official state passport. That does not belong to my client as of right. He can be removed. He might not even be a minister beyond uh, these proceedings. And therefore, by operation of law, that particular passport must go back to 
to the state and it be destroyed. So we are not being disingenuous when we elected not to say much about it. And of course, with regard to his personal passport, our offer still stands. If the state feels that they need it for whatever reasons, we'll gladly hand it over, provided that in the event he were to be required to travel for personal or whatever means, as, as a non-flight risk, we believe that he should be entitled to have uh, that uh, opportunity to travel uh, be availed to him. Lastly, and this is on strict instructions, regardless of what you decide, Your Worship, my client has instructed me to firmly place it on record that he does not locate himself above the law. He does not. It is unfortunate because he's a politician, which is a matter of public record, that anything that pertains to his rights is even violated by those who are supposed to protect his rights. It's not for the court to have any ruling to be made on this, but I am under instructions to say that the first available opportunity, one phone call by Colonel Bujosi, he was raring to go and he went to see Colonel Bujosi earlier than what he would have intended. And lo and behold, out of the goodness of his heart and as a respectable and respectful citizen, his imminent arrest was publicized. Information pertaining to the details regarding the charges was given to the media. I say this because I only, as his legal representative, have sight of it today, literally in court, and it's a carbon copy of what is contained here. I'm simply asking the court to make take judicial notice of that because it does implicate uh, directly on his rights as encapsulated in Section 35. The fact that he's a minister does not denude him of his rights and does not entitle the NPA or anyone for that matter to violate his rights in the manner that had happened. I do not cast aspersions on my colleague in court. He has been anything, absolutely an epitome of professionalism and I dare say, if all our police were to act like the way Colonel Bujosi did, would live in a better constitutional architecture. He has been very professional in the manner in which he dealt with my client <coughs> up until his appearance. All culminating in a point that says he is by his own conduct a candidate to be released on bail. And having said that and mindful of the fact that the court has not had any evidence to the contract, I believe this is a point at which I must shut up because I do believe that I have made the point on behalf of my client. And if the court is so persuaded, I will humbly ask that he be released on 25,000 rands of bail. If there is any other intended conditions that the court is thinking of imposing, I'm ready to deal with those considerations while I'm on my feet. Other than that, Your Worship, I am indebted to the court and my colleagues for the intelligence. I do believe that Mr. Zizi must be sent home. Thank you. As the court pleases. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mkhafa, can I have your closing address, sir? Please, 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 and uh, the state, your, the respondent has the following address, Your Worship. I'll firstly start with uh, in res uh, address in respect of uh, first respondent, Your Worship. I can confirm that there are no pending matters, Your Worship, and first, the applicant. First applicant. First applicant, correct. Thank you. And that uh, there are no previous convictions in respect of the first applicant. The personal particulars of the applicant, first applicant, has also been confirmed, as is uh, his place of residence, Your Worship. The manner of arrest of uh, the first applicant, Your Worship. The applicant was telephonically contacted around the 15th of May this year, that is 2024, where a warning statement was obtained 
He has been uh, in contact, Your Worship, with the investigating <coughs> officer, with the le his legal representative, which then eventually culminated in him handing himself over to the police where he was then arrested this morning, Your Worship. So that would imply that the first applicant, Your Worship, is not a flood risk. I'll then proceed to deal with the provisions of Section 60, Subsection 4, in relation, firstly, to the interference either with uh, witnesses and or investigations. I can confirm and place on record that investigations in this matter have been completed. So well, there's no fear whatsoever on the part of this respondent or slash forward slash state that uh, the first applicant, Your Worship, will interfere with other state witnesses and or investigations. As indicated earlier, investigations have been completed, Your Worship. I can further confirm that uh, the first applicants to passport are currently in the custody and or possession of the investigating <coughs> officer, Colonel Bajos Yosh. The one aspect that I need to deal with in respect of the first applicant, Yosh, I can just refer the court as well as my learned two colleagues specifically in respect of uh, Mr. Smallsmith. You should all know that the affidavit have uh, been numbered at the bottom right, and I'm uh, specifically referring to paragraph 1.3.1, which will be on page 2. Which reads as follows, it is open codes, I have a South African and Canadian passport, which I've handed to the investigating officer today. I request that I be permitted to travel abroad, provided I get permission of the investigating officer and or prosecutor. Your Worship, with regard to the permission by either the investigating officer or the prosecutor, Your Worship, I suppose it should just be a bail condition that uh, when either of the accused, but because I'm currently dealing firstly with the first applicant, which is to travel, Your Worship, that should be communicated to the court and that the court can get an indication with regard to the itinerary and when that is done to the court, Your Worship, I think it's much more easier rather than the prosecutor and investigating officer being involved in this year. So I suggest, if the court so wishes, that it be placed as a bail condition that when the first respondent wishes to travel, the court can then be approached with the necessary application and the itinerary, then the court can then be record that on the charge sheet, Your Worship. Rather than avoiding a situation where the prosecutor or the investigating officer, Your Worship, will then be involved in granting the accused or the applicant, shall I say, a permission to travel, Your Worship. The other aspect, Your Worship, that I think I needed to touch on, Your Worship, is in relation to the warning statement, Your Worship. It is correct that uh, a warning statement has been obtained in respect of the first applicant, Your Worship. And, uh, that will, however, be dealt with at later stage in respect after the remand of this matter. The quantum that has been suggested by my colleague in respect of the first applicant is 30,000. Respondent has no objection that uh, the quantum membership can be fixed if the court grants bail at uh, the, uh, the requested amount of 30,000. In respect of uh, the first applicant, Your Worship, unless there is any other aspect on which this honorable court wishes to end, that will be the address in respect of the first applicant. Nothing further, thank you. Nothing further, correct. Yeah. All right. I'll deal, Your Worship, with leave of the court and I'll proceed dealing with uh, the second applicant. Likewise, the second applicant uh, has no pending matter that has been confirmed and there's no previous convictions.
personal particulars of the second respondent has been confirmed that is his place of residence? And with regard to the manner of arrest in respect of the second applicant, likewise with the first applicant, the second applicant was telephonically contacted around the 15th of May 2024, where a warning statement, Your Worship, was signed. That would speak to the fact that uh, he has been aware in relation to the investigation and the existence of the matter, firstly. And secondly, the respondent uh, submits that that speaks to the fact that the second applicant is also not a flood risk. The respondent has already indicated to this honorable court that investigations in this matter are complete. And with regard to the province of section uh, 60, subsection 4 of the Criminal Procedure Act, the respondent has no fear whatsoever that second respondent will either interfere firstly with investigations and or with witnesses. The worship of the respondent can also confirm that the personal passport of the second respondent is currently in the custody and or possession of the investigating officer, Your Worship. There are a couple of aspects or issues that has been raised by Mr. Majav on behalf of the second respondent. And firstly, that will be in relation to the merits of the matter, Your Worship. This is a bail application I'm not going to dissent and with the greatest of respect to the merits of the matter, Your Worship, because this is a bail application. With regard to witnesses, Your Worship, my colleague had suggested that the state at least should provide the court with wit list of witnesses, which the state intends to call so that at least the second respondent can know, and by extension, the first respondent would know who the witnesses are in this matter, Your Worship. Your Worship, indeed, the investigations are complete. Copies of the docket are ready to be provided to the defense. The state, as indicated earlier, has no fear whatsoever that any of the witnesses or a, a, either of the applicants before court will interfere with witnesses, Your Worship. If by any chance that arises, Your Worship, that will be dealt with at that particular stage, Your Worship. But there is no fear whatsoever, and that should be re-emphasized, that the respondent has no fear whatsoever that either of the two applicants will interfere with the, with the witnesses. The issue of passport that has been raised by Mr. Majavi, Your Worship, it's uh, already been dealt with. It is the personal, pa personal passport of the second applicant is currently in possession of uh, the investigation of Your Worship. And likewise, the issue of traveling, if he wishes to do so, the second uh, respondent, Your Worship. It would only be appropriate, Your Worship, as I have already indicated with regard to the first respondent, that by extension be applicable to the second respondent that when their bail condition should then be ordered by the court that when the second respondent also wishes to travel the court be approached with the necessary application with the necessary itinerary and the court will then make a decision in respect to that particular application unlike as indicated earlier that either the state or the prosecutor or the investor of sale should decide or be advised about the possible traveling abroad of either of the applicants. Your Worship. The last aspect that my colleague, Mr. Majavu, touched on, Your Worship, 
is a publication of the chart sheet, which in a way would have uh, encroached upon the constitutionally entrenched rights of uh, his client, Joshua. I've noted that he had indicated hastily that he has no, he has no expression in respect of the possible leaking of this document by the state, Your Worship. I can clearly indicate, Your Worship, that uh, I only gave or provided both uh, my colleagues this morning the charge sheet. So as to how, Your Worship, as my colleague indicates, that it landed in the public and obviously in the social media, Your Worship, that is surely beyond the respondent's control and knowledge, Your Worship. That I can categorically state, Your Worship. I have noted, with regard to the quantum that has been suggested in respect of bail by the second applicant, it is 25,000 rands, which is obviously distinct from what the, sec the first respondent has suggested, Your Worship. The respondent's submission, Your Worship, in this matter is that uh, bail should not be denied by the fact that it is unaffordable to the, to, to the applicant. The respondent has no objection in respect of the amount that has been suggested in respect of the second applicant. So the 25,000 rents, Your Worship, is amenable to the respondent, Your Worship. Your Worship, unless uh, there is any other aspect, Your Worship, with regard to the second respondent that the court wishes to hear me, that will then uh, conclude the state's address, Your Worship, slash respondent's address, Your Worship. The only aspect that I need from the state is the fact that I don't know about the merits of the case. I would expect if I don't get it from the defense, which is the constitutional right, but section 60, subsection 8, I think capital A, will require me to get something as to what happened, how are they linked for me to arrive uh, to the conclusion of if it's in the interest of justice that they should be released on bail. So if I can get that information, remember <coughs> that bail is an inquiry, I need to get that information because with that, without that information, I would not have done my job. So I might just get clarity from the court. Uh, this honourable court inquiring from the state that is link between the applicants before court and the commission of the offence. If you can give me, if you don't want to disclose too much, but I need to know as to what happened on the facts, then I'll be able, because it's not me, it's also the section, if I can read it on record. Let me just get it. Yes, but you not have uh, any... Uh, doubt as to what the court is currently inquiring and with regard to the knowledge by the court of the law. Suffice to say that I can just indicate at this stage yeah. the charge is attached to the J-15 Yorship mm -hmm. and the facts in relation to the preamble to the charge sheet Yorship. So it is currently common knowledge Yorship. And that will be in respect of uh, the preamble to the charge sheet from paragraph 1 until paragraph 12, Your Worship, clearly indicates the basis or the cracks of the charges that are preferred against both applicants before court. All right, should I read it as it is, or the state does not want to, to read that part for the record's sake? Then I you should be limit myself to paragraph 1 to paragraph 8 of your church sheet. It currently forms part of the record, Your Worship. <coughs> but if the court is uh, amenable that ask the, the respondent should read it into the record, Your Worship, uh, I may then proceed doing that. Please do. Thank As you, Mr. Court, Your Worship. Your Worship, I will then proceed. I will uh, dispense the reading of uh, the top, par top portion of the for the charge sheet, Your Worship, and I will then proceed reading from paragraph 1. Thank you, sir. It is the general preamble to the charge sheet, whereas at all relevant times to the charge sheet, point 1, 
enterprise outsourcing holding is a holding company duly incorporated according to the laws of the South Africa with the registration number 1998 forward slash 014669 forward slash 06 and registered address at EOH Business Park, Kilolis View, Osborne Lane in Bedford View. Two, EOH is one of the largest information communication and technology companies in Africa. And Stephen Van Kola is the group chief executive officer. At the time of the commission of the offense, your Shabbat, that should be emphasized. Okay. Paragraph three. Tactical Software System, B2R LTD, in brackets, TSS, is a private company duly incorporated according to the laws of the Republic of South Africa with the following registration number, 1997 forward slash 004051 forward slash 07. And four, the directorship of TSS has changed over time and between the period 23rd of October 2012 and the 18th of September 2013. Accused number one was the director of TSS. According to the records of the CIPC on the 6th March 2015, on uh, the 5th of March 2017, email correspondence was forwarded to accused one as the representative of TSS regarding the notification that the annual returns of the aforementioned periods were due. Point five, TSS operates in an APSA bank account with the following account number it's four zero seven nine double zero three one two eight the signatories of the said bank account are Daniel Colin Keith McKay and accused one point six accused one further operates a personal bank FNB bank account with the following account number six two two three double three double eight 439, in respect of which he is the sole signatory. Point seven, accused to is a member of the African National Congress, ENC in brackets, during the period January 2014 and December 2017, accused to was employed as the national spokesperson of the ANC. Point eight, accused to operates an APSA bank account with account number 4079757039. Seven zero three two in respect of which he is the sole signatory. Point nine, State Information Technology Agency, COCTLTD, in bracket CETA, is a state owned company charged with the responsibility of IT services to the government, with its registered address as follows 459 CETA Street, Erasmus Clough in Pretoria. Point ten, on a regular basis, CETA invites private entities to, tend to a tender process as service providers where CETA does not have the capacity to render the specified IT services. Point 11. For the period April 2015 to February 2016, IQS 2 received the following direct payments and luxury accommodation paid by and or facilitated by IQS number one. Your Worship, all that is contained yeah. in the schedule. I'm not sure should I read that no, or dispense the with the reading, Your Worship. I think we're all aware of the schedule contained in the church sheet. So we dispense with the reading there of Your Thank Worship. you. Dispense with the reading That's of the schedule. <coughs> I'll then proceed reading on paragraph 12, Your Worship. The direct payments and luxury accommodation as set out in paragraph 11 above, paid by or facilitated by accused one, to and on behalf of accused two were gratifications as defined in Section 1 of the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act 12 of 2004, for the interventions by accused two in a government procurement process to advance the interest of accused number one, TSS, and EOH. Paragraph 13, Your Worship, 14 and 15, only refers to the legal definitions, firstly, in respect of what gratification is, and secondly, the definition of unlawful activities in respect of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act 121 of 1998. Thank you. I think that will suffice for the court. Thank you, Mr. Mokaka. As please the court. Is there any other aspect on which this one has please the court? If there's any reply to the address of the state from the defense, I will allow you to do so. Your Worship, uh, I'll be brief. Uh, it seems as if the only issue here is 
what do we do in the event that uh, the applicant wants to travel overseas? May I say he's got no plans at the moment. Uh, may I also say that uh, um, my uh, my suggestion that the police and the and the prosecutor uh, has to approve it uh, is because of the fact that their stance on bail is that it's an unopposed application, and you've heard their view on the uh, on the unlikelihood of uh, 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 of the applicant running away, if you'd excuse the colloquialism. Why I did not. Uh, recommend that you should have a say on that man is because it is going to create um, unnecessary legal fees and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, 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 and quite a bit of effort for everyone uh, to come down to court in a matter where the police and, and the prosecutor has already expressed their view. However, you're in charge of the proceedings and if you would like to monitor uh, from the bench the movements of, uh, uh, of accused one um, and, and accused two. Uh, I will have no issue with that, but from a practical point of view, I'm very confident that uh, I can leave the yes or no's in the hands of the police and the prosecutor. Thank you. Uh, Your Worship, I do have something to say. Firstly, there was merit my to having not said something about the merits. My understanding of the law is that for the court to exercise its discretion, it has to have some semblance of what the issue is about. So the court was spot on when the court asked that question. With respect, it is not open to the state to say we don't want to defend to descend into the merits. Otherwise, on what basis can the court then exercise its judicial discretion? But I'm happy with how uh, the court has dealt with that aspect. I will not belabor it. Safe to say, if we had the charge sheet, we would have quite simply pointed out to the state, the error of their ways, we should have weighed heavily in the consideration of whether or not the interest of justice permit my client's sentence. We can't just leave it to chance just because the state says we're not opposing. And the point is this. My learned friend says to you, uh, paragraphs 14 and 15, don't worry, it just talks to the definitions. But exactly that is the nub of the issue. We are brought here on common purpose. It's a fact were brought here on breaker. And central to the whole case is the issue or the definition of gratification. And you know what is interesting, Your Worship? You look at what the allegation that has been read into the record is about who paid who and the schedule that we omitted. And my client is described as an ANC official, a spokesperson, no heart. Not in government, no indication in the preamble as they are required to do by law, not because Majavu says so. What is the nature of the gratification of an unlawful <laughs> nature from a non-government official? And as a matter of fact, the ANC is not even uh, co-accused here. That is why I refer to it. But that's an issue about which we'll fight in the trial court. But there was moment to that submission. The the issue with regard to the suggestion that the court should monitor the movements, with respect, it is unmeritorious. It is going to be an abuse of the already strained judicial resources. In instances where the state says, no, both of them are not flight risks. In fact, they handed themselves over. So on what basis can it be suggested that a court must then be drawn into administrative aspects? I do not leave it like my learned friend says in the hands of the court. I strongly submit that the court should stay clear of that arrangement. If one thinks of it uh, uh, practically, we are all practitioners here. When a legally trained person says an application to the court, it presupposes a formal application on notice. Now, and that application must be adjudicated to by a judicial office. What dispensation in the criminal a procedure act makes provision for that. I'm simply saying, in all politeness, that we are overburdening the judicial system. 
there is absolutely no mischief that can be said to be sought to be avoided by the imposition of that condition. I therefore humbly urge the court to rather, if the court is so inclined, leave it at saying the applicants, certainly on behalf of my client, he must do no more than notifying the investigating officer. He does not have a direct link with the prosecutor for that matter. It is for the investigating officer to liaise with the prosecutor who is managing that particular docket and to say, I intend traveling, here is my itinerary. <coughs> Ordinarily, the courts don't get involved in those extracural arrangements. Why now? Why now? I ask rhetorically. So I stand by my submission that if the court is inclined to go in that direction, I didn't even realize that uh, the passport was already handed over. That on its own is a step enough to restrict his movements. Other than that, Your Worship, I stand by my submissions, and I'm glad uh, my learned colleague has clarified the issue about the leakage of the charge sheet. I was not suggesting that it is him. He's a decent fellow. I've known him for many years. But the fact of the matter is the media and other people other than my client have a duplicate of this charge verbatim, and I only got it a few minutes ago as confirmed by him. It is something that we'll deal with outside of this court, but I just needed to place it on record to worship. Those are my submissions as a court, please. Okay. If I may. Okay, Mr. Mkakawa. Just one aspect, and that is in relation to whether or not both uh, applicants, your worship, uh, when intending to travel at a later stage, should then approach the court, or there should be an arrangement between the prosecutor, investigating officer, and any of the clients, your worship, or the applicants. I, for one, Your Worship, I'm not going to monitor the movements of uh, not only these uh, applicants before court or any other accused for that matter, Your Worship. So I'm not going to be involved in relation to that. If the court is inclined to take the view of uh, the defense in relation to that, there must be an arrangement between the basic mm -hmm. officer and the applicant, Your Worship. That may be so, Your Worship, but the state is, the respondent is not going to get involved in that. Hence, there was a suggestion that let it be on record, Your Worship, and that it forms part of the bail condition, Your Worship. I understand the legal fees and implications that are involved in bringing an application or for any other appearance, Your Worship. But this respondent, Your Worship, cannot certainly be involved. And I'm glad Mr. Majavu raised this, that uh, the applicant or accused does not have any direct contact with the state, Your Worship. And as a result, if that were to be done, it should be done if the court is inclined to do that between the investigating officer, Your Worship, and the accused, Your Worship, so forward <coughs> slash respondent. However, I still suggest that it should, then it should be on record, formally in court, so that that can be done on record, Your Worship. That will be the respondent's final address. Thank you, sir. All right, I will just give an extemporary ruling just to speed up this matter. I'll ask the applicants to rise. The first and the second applicant are standing before this court on charges of corruption, where the amount involved falls under Schedule 5. They are lodging an application for their release on bail. The purpose of this bail is to strike a balance between the interest of society and the Nepali of an accused person. In terms of Section 6011B of the Criminal Procedure Act 51 of 1977, the accused shall be detained in custody until he or she is dealt with in accordance with the law. The section has shifted the onus that rested on the state, on the state in bail applications to the applicants who has to adduce evidence to prove on a balance of probabilities that the interest of justice permit his release on bail. To consider what is in the interest of justice, the court is guided by the factors listed in section 60 subsection 4A to E, which are listed as follows, where there is a likelihood that the accused, if released on bail, will endanger the safety of the public or any particular person or will commit a Schedule 1 offence, or where there is a likelihood 
that the accused, if released on bail, will attempt to evade his or her trial, or where there is a likelihood that the accused, if released on bail, will attempt to influence or intimidate witnesses, or to conceal or destroy evidence, or where there is a likelihood that the accused, if released on bail, will undermine or jeopardize the objectives or the proper functioning of the criminal justice system, including the bail system. Or where, in exceptional circumstances, there is a likelihood that the release of the accused will disturb the public order for, safety, for security. The court has to weigh the interest of justice against the right of an accused to his or personal freedom, and in particular, the prejudice such accused will suffer if bail is refused. In doing so, the court will be guided by the factors listed in section 60, subsection 9, that is A to G. Bail is a constitutional <coughs> right of an applicant. Section 35, subsection 1F of the Constitution provides that everyone who is arrested for allegedly committing an offence has the right to be released from detention if interest of justice permit subject to reasonable conditions. In the matter of S. versus Acheson, 1991, Volume 2, SACR, page 805, and cited with approval in, in Nell and others versus S. 2018, Volume 1, SACR, page 76, to Jake. The Honorable Court stated, stated that an accused person cannot be kept in detention pending his trial as a form of anticipatory punishment. The presumption in law is that he is innocent until his guilt has been established in a court. The court will therefore ordinarily grant bail of a, to an accused person unless this is likely to prejudice the ends of justice. The unreported case number A82 of 2013 of S. versus Nguna from Houghton, North uh, Pretoria, delivered on the 22nd of February 2013 states that a court hearing a bail application should ensure that the strength of the state case and the probability of the conviction when considered does not displace the central, namely whether the interest of justice permit release of bail. In Matebula's case, it was stated that the strength of the state case should not displace the central question in, in any bail application. Uh, which is whether or not the interest of justice permit the release of an accused. Now the court will come and deal with the evidence presented. I would say that the Act, the Section 611B requires that evidence be presented and it was done so in this matter where Exhibit A and Exhibit B were considered as evidence and were presented by the applicants. The state did not lead either oral evidence or present documentary evidence in the form of an affidavit. So there was no evidence tendered by the state. However, they address court from sidebar where they address the court on their uh, on how they feel that the applicants should be granted bail and also on the merits of the case. So the court will say that I'm not going to repeat the personal information that has been given to this court covered by Exhibit A and Exhibit B, but the court will state that, yes, it is in the interest of justice. There is no factor that is stated in Section 60, Subsection 4 to Subsection E that is present in this matter that this court should deny way. Furthermore, the state is not also opposing this application. And the applicants that are standing before me are figures that are known to the public. That states on its own that they are not flight risk. So on that strength, I will say that the applicants manage to prove on a balance of probabilities that they are candidates for bail, and bail is granted by this court. Now I'll come to the second leg, which is an amount. I'm going to interfere with that one because um, I see there's disparity coming uh, relating to the amounts. I'm one of the presiding officer. I know that one of the issues that the court should consider is the means of the applicant if you can pay that amount of bail. 
And this court is of the opinion that the second applicant, if this court can increase the bail to an amount of 30,000, the accused, it will not turn to amount accused number two of this court of refusing you to be released on bail. Now, the court will make sure that the bail is of the same amount and it's granted in respect of applicant number one and number two and fixed in an amount as prayed for by applicant number one in the amount of 30,000 as well as in respect of, accused of applicant number two, it's fixed an amount of 30,000. Now I'm coming to the condition. The first condition is that first and second applicant make sure that you attend court on every date, time and venue that this matter is postponed to until it's finalized. Remain in attendance until your name is called. If you fail to do so, warrant of arrest will be authorized immediately against you. The bail <coughs> will be cancelled. Bail money will be forfeited to the state. Secondly, failure to attend court, it is a criminal offence on its own. So if convicted for that, it will be a term of imprisonment or a fine as a sentence. The second aspect I'm going to request is that um, it pertains to the passports. I agree that the passports which I have been handed to the investigating officer, probably I'm talking about the personal passport. I don't have uh, any issue regarding the one of the state pertaining to applicant number two because that one falls away the moment you lose the position. So on the personal passports, they be kept with the I.O. till finalization of this matter. All the personal passports that you have, applicant one and two. If there is a movement that is warranted outside the country, the I.O. should be informed of that movement so that the I.O. can know about your movement. I know I heard Mr. Mahakave saying that I don't want to be involved. You know, this thing of having a sole decision to one person, sometimes it's not good. But the NPA should be informed that uh, the applicant intends to move and then they are, are notified of the movement. The last aspect, it pertains to the witnesses. That is the last condition. Now, the applicants should not have contact with the state witnesses. I'm going to request Mr. Mkakabe to provide the list of the witnesses by end of today so that they know who the witnesses are involved, directly or indirectly. So those, there should be no contact with the state witnesses. Those are my conditions for the Spain. As pleases the court. As part, please, Your Worship. Your Worship, uh, can I just uh, address the court on the last aspect that the court has just indicated that the state should provide the, the list, list of witnesses? You may be subject to applicants. Your Worship, I humbly request that it be provided at a later stage, Your Worship. Uh, the reason is that I'm unavailable okay. physically as of today up until the end of the month, Your Worship. I will, however, liaise with my colleagues in relation to that your right. will be made available at the later date stage. of making this list available will be discussed between the parties involved i'm talking about the legal representative and the prosecutor yes, please accord you thank you that's sensible leadership thank you all right suppose the outstanding thing you should at this stage it's a real and day yes you should my colleague and i have approached the custodian of the central diary with a real mandate the agreed upon date with leave of this honorable court is the 23rd of July, 23rd July. It is back to court number 10, Your Worship. 23rd of July, court 10. Correct, Your Worship. And the reason for the remand, in the light of the fact that uh, copies of the docket will be provided to the defense after this remand, it is for consultation and instructions, Your Worship. And I suppose both my colleagues will then confirm and address the court in respect to the date, Your Worship. As please the court. Thank you, sir. Mr. Smallsmith? 
Your Worship, we've agreed to that date in advance and we will collect the copies of the docket now and hopefully on that day, if all the pre-trial issues have been finalized, we'll be able to postpone for trial, Your Worship. Thank you. Your Worship, I confirm the suitability of the date. I also confirm <coughs> that uh, my friend on behalf of the state has indicated that the investigating officer is in a state of readiness to give us hard copies of the docket today. And on that basis, between now and the next date, we should engage with regard to all pre hearing matters so that we don't overburden this court unnecessarily. So if the docket is made available, it's all systems. Thank you. As a court basis. Please be patient with me. I just want to write the conditions on the chat sheet. Your Worship, may I beg the leave of the court to approach? You can do so. Indebted to the court of worship. You're welcome, sir.
May you please raise the two applicants? <coughs> now your matter is transferred to court number 10. The matter is postponed to the 23rd of July, back to court number 10 at half past 8. It is for consultation as well as instruction. Accused 1 and 2, in custody, bail granted and fixed at 30,000 for each accused. Thank you. You may step down.
you wish it might be provisional excuse to go and pay. Yes, Thank you. All right.